a walking disaster this morning. I'm not the most organized person in the world. Um, okay. So last week, I showed the video, um, How to Get Your Shovel Back. If you remember that, it was, a, you know, talking about the kids who are very brilliant, they can say their alphabet in five different languages and, and they don't know how to get their shovel back. Somebody takes their shovel and they have a complete meltdown. Um, and the ooey gooey lady then talked about how that, uh, that carries well into adulthood. People don't know how to get their shovel back. Somebody takes something from them, it could be a, she said it could be a parking spot, could be, you know, I'm always the one who has to close at the end of the day, and, uh, and people have these complete meltdowns. Um, and I kind of translated that to, uh, to church culture because, you know, that certainly uh, carries over into that. We're going to pause for a second. So there's that. You only have one. You have Enoch. So he's it. You're going with them. Thank you, guys. Um, so I, th I think I forgot to put my little windscreen on here, too. I don't want you guys online to hear my heavy breathing. Um, but I, I, think, I, I think this past year has br been pretty illustrative of temper tantrums on steroids. Right? Like we look around and have seen so many people behaving so badly in so many different areas um, that it kind of makes your head spin. And you just look. And I mean, the, the amount of unrest and the amount of anxiety, the amount of stress, um, and, and people just fighting over anything and everything. Uh, and that's, that's a huge cause for churches closing their doors this year, is honestly. Um, it, it, it's the amount of intensity that, that sped up, um, part, in part because of the pandemic, but uh, people just finding reasons to fight, and they don't know how to handle conflict. And so uh, people scatter, and when, when people see people fighting, uh, they don't really want to be a part of it, right? It's, uh, and I don't blame them. Nobody wants to walk into an abusive home, this explosive home where there's yelling and screaming and nobody's getting along, and be like, I feel at home here, you know, I think I'll stay. So churches don't realize that or, or don't care about that. Um, and, and, and they fight not thinking about the consequences. So I want to, I want to begin by reading in uh, Romans 14. Last week we read from 1 Corinthians. This week we're going to read from Romans 14. This is one of my absolute favorite uh, chapters that Paul wrote because it's so powerful and it's so timeless. It's so timeless. Um, I'm just gonna start in verse one. Romans 14, starting in verse one. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. But do not, do not quarrel over opinions. That will preach, that verse alone will preach, right? Um, take, the, the person who's weak in faith, and welcome him. Don't, don't, don't send him away and be like, well, you, you, know, you don't really understand who God is, and you don't understand everything there is to know. And you've talked about this a lot. Like, Paul is laying down in some of his letters the most basic, foundational things known to humanity. Uh, don't kill each other. Um... Don't, uh, don't have sex with prostitutes. Uh, uh, like you're writing to Christians, right? Like Paul was writing to people for where they were, where they were at in their faith. So here he's saying, for the one who's weak in faith, welcome him. And don't quarrel over opinions. Is that not what people have done this whole past year? Jesus, uh, WWJD, Jesus would, I mean, pick an issue, but the big issue this last year, obviously, has been mask wearing. Um, if Jesus loved his neighbors, he would wear a mask. If Jesus didn't, I mean, if Jesus loved his neighbors, he wouldn't wear a mask. He would have faith in God, right? Like both sides of the issue, people are coming up with these ridiculous hypotheticals that have nothing to do with 
Christianity, period. And that's just an example. It's not that I'm not forming an opinion one way or the other. I'll keep that to myself. Um, but right, matters of opinion, they don't matter. They don't, they don't really matter. Um, verse, verse 2, Paul says, One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person only eats vegetables. <clears throat> did you ever hear, um, did you ever hear people who are like hardcore, like I'm talking religious vegans? Did you ever hear them talk? And then regret that you heard them talk, right? Like when things become religious and you're saying, if you're not a vegan, you hate Mother Earth. Really? Right? Paul says, if people want to be vegan, if people want to be vegetarians, um, who cares? Leave them alone. <laughs> right? But he goes on. He's just getting warmed up. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Well, that's good news. <laughs> who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another person esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Um, here's an age-old Church of Christ, a good um, traditional example of this, right? Um, Christmas, Easter. Uh, there are some who, uh, you know, I'm kind of in the middle, whatever, I, I'll, I'll preach an Easter sermon. I have no problem doing that. I'll preach a, a, a Jesus' birth sermon around Christmas time. I have no problem doing that. But I'm not like, die hard, we have to do this. And if, if we don't have a Christmas service, then it's, it's no service at all. But then there are people on the opposite end of the spectrum, and they're like, well, every day is Jesus' resurrection. And, and, you know, we should celebrate that every Sunday. So Easter Sunday, if you're having a special sermon, you're, you're in sin. I'm like, you know, um, we, we have these really strongly formulated opinions where we cast judgment on other people, and, and they just don't matter. So Paul's lumping everybody together and saying, it doesn't matter. Uh, verse 6, the one who observes the one day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why, uh, or, or you, why do you despise your brother? For we all, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Verse 13, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. And I'll put in parentheses because there are places where Paul says, are we not to judge those inside? Paul's not talking about matter of opinion in those passages. Here, Paul's talking about matter of opinion. Don't pass judgment on each other over these matters of opinion. They literally don't matter. Um, he says, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy um, the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So let me, let me pause there for a second. If we don't look like a group who is righteous 
and peaceful and joyful, maybe we need to reevaluate. Right? There are some churches where you walk inside and it's so toxic. It's such a toxic environment. And they're anything but righteous. They're anything but uh, peaceful. And they're anything but joyful. But they still call themselves the church. And Paul's coming back and saying, not so fast. Uh, verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the one eating is not uh, from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So Paul's overarching point is uh, learn how to get your shovel back, one, but be anchored in faith, right? Let that matter not your opinions. Keep your opinions to yourself. Um, if you think that, whatever, I mean, pick, pick a subject. If you think that Saturday is still the Holy Sabbath and we need to refrain from work and, and you know, if, if we work, then we're violating, you know, our conscience and we're violating our faith towards God. If you believe that, then great. Uh, observe Saturday is, is this, the, Christian Sabbath. Um, if you feel like uh, you have to have a Passover meal um, as Christians on, on the Passover, do it. Uh, but don't pass judgment on other people who don't hold that day as holy. And they're, and they're still living their life for God. Uh, we have all kinds of things that, uh, at the end of the day, are, are opinion. And they matter to us. And, and Paul's not saying, you know, these things shouldn't matter to you. That's not what he's saying at all. Paul's saying, if these things matter to you, keep doing them. If you're doing them for God, if you're a strict vegetarian and you will not let meat touch your lips, Paul's message isn't, you guys knock it off. Quit it. You know, there's nothing wrong with meat. Right? Paul's point is, keep doing that. But for you people who eat meat and have no problem doing that, and as long as you're doing that for God, don't pass judgment on them. And vice versa. Don't pass judgment on each other and tell each other that you're less of a Christian because, you know, you eat meat or you don't eat meat. And vice versa. Because that then becomes your... What? Your religion. That becomes your God. And we've seen this over this past year. If, you know, uh, pick an issue. There are a lot of them out there. <laughs> and people making these as the, 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 the test of your faith. I've seen so many posts on social media that I'm just looking at this and, and, and like people saying that other people are not Christians. I mean, uh, here's an example. If, if you meet in person, if you're meeting in person instead of just online, you're putting all these people at risk and you're murder. You're no, be no better than a murderer. You're not truly a Christian. You don't really believe in Christ. And I'm just thinking... I mean, I, I'm, I mean, here's my opinion for, for what it's worth. And this is, this is my opinion light because I have some pretty hefty opinions, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. But my opinion is, if what you're doing is, is first of all, wise, if you're not being foolish, if you're not being reckless, you know, if you're not coughing on people, sneezing on people, rubbing all over people, and just being gross and unsanitary... Um, if you're being smart, what's that? Yeah, right, exactly. But if, 
you know, if, if, you're, if you're being smart, if you're being wise, if you're being careful uh, in the midst of a pandemic and you still want to meet together, great. If you don't, also great. I mean, both of those are viable options. You can still love God and meet together. You can still love your neighbor and meet together. Uh, you can still love God and not meet together. You can still, you know, you know what I mean? So there are all these issues where people form these really strong opinions and then they impose that on other people. So here's something that's happening. Um, and we're, we're going to make a little bit of a, sh a shift, uh, but not much of one. But now the issue the church has faced, and we're all going to face that, is how do, we, how do we function as a church body that's been radically changed culturally post-pandemic? We've all been changed, whether we know it or not. Um, the way that we do church, the way that we behave as church as God's gathered people, has changed permanently. Um, so I want to point you to an article, and I thought this was really, really good. This is, um, this is an article by uh, Carrie Newhoff. Carrie Newhoff is, is one of these other guys that I think really has his finger on the pulse of the church and what's going on. Um, I would put Tom Rayner in that category. Um, but Carrie Newhoff definitely... Um, has his finger on the pulse of what's going on in American church. Uh, he wrote this article, I'm not sure when, it, it's, it's not dated, um, but I read it and I thought it was really good. The title of this blog is Eight Disruptive Church Trends That Will Rule 2021, The Rise of the Post-Pandemic Church. Um, I'll just jump right in. Number one, the majority of attenders may no longer be in the room. We're living that. We have more people on any given Sunday online. You guys who are online far outnumber the number of people who are physically here. Physical church attendance has been in decline for decades and COVID in all likelihood accelerated the decline even further. The average church has seen their reopened attendance come in around 36% of previous levels. Almost no leader I've interviewed expects church attendance to jump back to pre-COVID levels for a while. For years, most pastors didn't know how to handle anyone engaged in the message or mission outside their facility. Moving forward, many church leaders will recognize that people who are engaging from home or other places will count just as much as those who are attending in a facility. I thought that was really significant. People who, you guys who are online with us are every bit as significant and a part of the living, breathing body of, of Christ as those of us who are in seats. Um, he said people, people have realized they don't have to go to a building to engage. And as a result, some won't do that nearly as, as much in the future. As 2021 rolls on, many growing churches will see off-facility attendance, home participation, micro-gatherings, and distributed uh, gatherings eclipse facility-based attendance. The number of people participating in the mission who are not in the building on a Sunday will surpass the number of people participating in the mission inside the building. So in other words, he's predicting, and I believe rightfully so, that the number of people actively engaged, he's not talking about attendance, he's not talking about just showing up to, to worship service. The people actively engaged in the mission of the church, actively serving, actively participating, actively in the lives of their neighbor, actively serving and helping people, that number is going to eclipse, the number of people online who are doing that is going to eclipse the number of people who are here on any given Sunday who are doing the same mission work. Um, what pastors have to understand quickly is that this, it, this trend isn't about people who are dropping out. It's about people who are leaning in. So it's not that people are just saying, well, I'm done with church and you know, traditional church. It, it, it's, uh, it's people who are actively engaged in church um, 
because for a number of reasons, there's a host of reasons, uh, they may not be here. Uh, I, we just had our first actual group who was there um, for our Bible study for, for people who are online. By the way, if you're watching this online and uh, you want to find out more information about the small group uh, via Zoom, that's specifically for uh, those of you who are online, just shoot me an email and I will give you um, all the information about that small group. We're meeting Tuesdays at 10 o'clock. Uh, we had a group this week. Uh, I think there were six of us in, in that group. That was one of the best groups. Um, actually, Sue, you were part of that group too. Uh, we had, I thought, a really good group, really solid, um, great discussion. Um, and the overarching arching message is not what can we learn, but what can we do? This is where we're at. This is a good thing. This is not something that we're like, well, you know, people online are just lazy and they don't want to be here. No, it's that we have people in Texas and Minnesota and all over the place who, yeah, Australia. Uh, we have people literally all over the world who are saying, we're part of your, your local church congregation. How do we serve? That's fantastic. That, that's, that's the church embodied, right? Uh, number two, disruption. Uh, I like that he calls these disruptions. Isn't that what it's, what it's called? Eight disruptive church trends that will rule 2021. <laughs> and I think that's a little bit of a, a, a play that Carrie's doing because it's, it's disruptive to what? Not to a yeah, it's disruptive to our traditions. It's disruptive to our, our, what we view as normalcy. It's disruptive to our, um, our comfort. It's dis not disruptive to Christianity at all. It's quite the opposite. Uh, number two, growing churches will shift their focus from gathering to connecting. We've been so focused on getting people in the building and um, we even call them faithful members, right? That's, the, that's code for people who sit in a pew. Faith, they are such faithful members. They've been faithful members for 40 years. Okay, define faithful member. Are they, are they actively engaged in the mission of, of Christ and his kingdom? Or are they faithfully showing up, right? Are we focused on gathering or are we focused on connecting? Carrie says there's going to be this radical, there's already this radical shift from gathering to connecting. Uh, he said this leads us to the second trend. Historically, the church has wagered almost everything on gathering people in a building. This year, however, whoop, growing churches will focus less on gathering and much more on connecting. Uh, by the way, on, on, I'm going to put another plug in. On Wednesday nights, we're walking through... Um, uh, we're walking through the book. Uh, I have it right here. Uh, Tom Rayner and Eric Geiger, Simple Church. Uh, we're walking through chapter by chapter. And one of the things that we talked about uh, on Wednesday nights is we are in radical need of a new, well thought out, very clear, very simple process of moving Christians from walking in the doors to being an active uh, disciple who's living out the mission of Christ. Uh, we talked about our mission statement that's hung on the wall for years, and we've, we've kind of drifted away from this, and we've realized that this mission statement that's up on the wall isn't really a process. It doesn't move people. It sounds good. It's, I think, very biblical, but it doesn't move people. So, this idea that we're going to move beyond this gathering mindset. We've got to get people here on Sunday. We're now shifting our mindset, us included. We're shifting our mindset to how do we, how do we focus on connection? How do we focus on getting people connected both to Christ and to each other? How do we get them serving out in, in their respective communities? Um... The easiest way to think about this is the same way church leaders have thought about small groups for the last 25 years. Almost no church leader today feels threatened by the idea that hundreds or thousands of people 
will be meeting in their homes to connect with other people. The church facilities group doesn't host them in a centralized facility. Instead, leaders simply connect people who want to be connected and engage them in the mission. You connect people, you engage them in the mission, period. Where they do that is entirely dependent on where they are. Geographically, whether we, whether, whether we like it or whether we don't, I happen to like it a lot, the majority of our church attenders are not geographically in Somerset. They're not located here. They're not even in our town. A lot of you guys online are not even in our state. Some of you are not even in our country. I think that's exciting. I, I think that's invigorating. Uh, number three, some church pastors will try to fill auditoriums while others focus on fulfilling the mission. You're still going to have those who, uh, they, they want to inflate their ego. They want to fill up the church building. That's where they put all their eggs in that basket of filling up their, their, their uh, facility. He says the first two trends are disorienting, and it's easy to see why they would seem discourage, discouraging to many leaders. It's a whole new paradigm the church is emerging into. Just, um, just search the comments on this blog or social media, and you'll see church leaders who are having a really hard time coming to terms with what's happening. I get it. It's hard. As a result, the natural tendency will be to ignore trends one and two and focus on filling up auditoriums again once everything is fully open. That might create a short-term win, but result in a longer-term but result in a longer-term loss and missed opportunity. After all, for most, uh, for most leaders, filling rooms was getting harder uh, long before the pandemic. It's getting, in other words, it's getting harder and harder to fill up auditoriums because people aren't surface-level people. They don't want to just passively sit in a pew, twiddle their thumbs, play church bingo or whatever, um, and then go out and not have any connections the rest of the week. People are dissatisfied with that. They want connection. They want purpose. They want to serve. They want to get, get their uh, arm sleeves rolled up, and they want to get in the lives of people. Um, and that's good news. Number four, growing churches will see the Internet and their buildings differently. Uh, so what do you do with our building? Great question. You use it to equip people, not just gather them. That's our theme for this year. Equipping people for works of ministry for the building up of what? Of the church. And, and that's one of the things on Wednesday night uh, in, in Simple Church, they're saying if you have these programs in your church that are not connected to your purpose, Get rid of them or repurpose them, right? To move people from walking in the building to actively serving, uh, serving their neighbor, loving their neighbor, calling unchurched people into the kingdom of Christ. Uh, for too many years, pastors have been focused on one thing, getting the greatest number of people in the room at the same time. Sometimes that's about ministry. Sometimes, honestly, it's about ego. I'll confess to both. The church facilities of the future will be places where people assemble to be equipped to do the ministry during the week. I realize that theoretically, we, we've always believed that, but often haven't behaved that way. We believed, and, and what we believed and how we behave are, are often two very different things. Uh, I'll amen that. Uh, number five, content alone won't cut it. Community and connection will. Again, opening up, you know, putting a pair of hinges on the side of the brain, opening that up, sprinkling some information inside, closing it up and saying, now we've planted the seeds. Go grow, little one. It doesn't work. We know for a fact it doesn't work. It wasn't intended to work that way. What does work is getting people to connect to God and his word and each other and equipping them, teaching them, discipling them to get into the lives of other people. And by the way, that's a very messy work. Getting into the lives of other people requires time and energy and focus and 
uh, prayer and uh, what's that? Yeah, yeah, it's exhausting. It requires a great deal of rest and recovery and uh, disappointment and watching people who you've discipled and, and who you've mentored uh, die of overdoses and, you know, uh, people get sick and people wander away from the faith. It's messy work. Kingdom work is messy work. And so content alone, preaching powerful lessons and hoping that that will transform people's lives um, is falling pretty short, and people are going to have to come to terms with that. Um, Number six, generational differences will become clearer than ever. Shifting gears a little, one of the creeping trends uh, in the last few years is that generational differences are becoming sharper than ever. While according to one survey, 71% of boomers prefer physical worship as opposed to digital or hybrid church, only 41% of Gen Z preferred physical worship. In other words, it's it's skewed almost polar opposites, almost equally. Um, Boomers, and I'm, I'm probably right in the in the middle. Um, I still, I mean, I lean definitely towards physical. I, I like being in person. Uh, I prefer being in person. Um, but boomers, if you're not here, you're not, you're not part of the church. Gen Z are, are quite the opposite. They prefer hybrid church. They prefer digital church over being there physically. Uh, That's, I think, really telling and and really interesting. And and it's not going to be that, well, you know, us boomers are right. and We just got to convince people to get into our buildings. Because if you do that, guess what's going to happen? You're going to lose them forever. You're going to lose them online, which is the one place where, where they are right now. Many studies these days show stark differences between younger adults and older adults. And while leaders love to pick apart, the, uh, pick apart data, uh, try a simpler approach. If you think attitudes about worship, racial justice, sexuality, economics, and even things like climate change aren't morphing where you live, for example, folks around here are pretty traditional, talk to a youth pastor. Um, we see that with, with our kids. And I think part of that is... Um, a heightened awareness. I don't think there's indoctrination, at least that, that we know of, that's going on at the schools, but our kids are very um, earth-oriented. Take care of the earth. Take care of the planet. Um, they're not radicals. They're not weirdos about it. They, they just, when they see litter scattered across the, the yard, my kids start picking it up. It, they can't stand. Now, I wish that applied in their bedrooms, um, <laughs> but outside, they can't physically stand to see litter and they, they start picking it up and they're like, this isn't, this isn't good for the environment and it looks ugly. Um, that's just where they are, where our generation, we look at it, we're like, man, that's terrible. You know, and we just keep driving. <laughs> um, we're just different. Number seven, the political and ideological churches will lose influence with the unchurched. Uh, If you're political, if you're all things political, and if you have these really strong ideologies, you're losing the unchurched. They don't want to hear it. Uh, He says, if 2020 surfaced anything, it's how political and ideological some kinds of churches have become. That's how I started this class, talking about that, right? It's easy in a tribalized culture to become uh, tribal. And while that might score some short-term points with like-minded people who are angry and self-righteous, both are characteristics of the political left and the right. Uh, I always say that legalism exists on both radical ends of the spectrum. People who are far left are legalist. People on the far right are legalists equally. You either believe this or you're wrong and you're going to hell and, you know, on and on and on and on, you don't really believe in God. Both ends of the spectrum are equally legalistic. So he says, unchurched people aren't looking for an echo 
of the culture, they're seeking an alternative to it. I thought that was a really powerful statement. And then number eight, spiritual entrepreneurs will thrive. These are hard times for all leaders, but as the dust settles and we emerge into the post-pandemic world, leaders who see opportunities instead of obstacles will thrive. One group sees everything as an obstacle. Well, look how far our culture has gone. Look at what we accept now. Look at, you know, this issue and this issue and this and the moral decline and crime on the rise. And, you know, we have a whole host of things and the church is doomed and we may as well just throw up our arms and our kids are doomed. And where if that's your attitude, you're, you're going you're gonna to fizzle out and die. If you look at the world and look at what's going on around us and look at opportunity, you're going to thrive. And uh, these churches right now, there, there are a bunch of churches that are coming out of uh, the post-pandemic era and they're doing really, really well. While I talk about churches closing their doors and it's happening in, in large numbers, there's a growing number of, of churches that are rising up, of house churches, of online churches that are really, really, really good, solid churches with good, solid people. Um, so anyway, that all kind of ties into, I, I think, to Paul, because I think we all have strong opinions about what's acceptable worship, what's not acceptable worship. Great. That's fantastic. We're entitled to those opinions. We're allowed to have those opinions. Those opinions should be validated. But we also shouldn't enforce that on other people and say that because I believe, you know, we should all be here in person or else, you know, we're not really Christians. If we believe that and we start enforcing that on other people, we're losing a lot of people for the kingdom and vice versa. Uh, if we say, you know, online is the way to go and if you're coming here, then... You're just wasting your time. You're losing a lot of people, a lot of really, really good, godly, faithful people. So, yeah, hybrid, um, hybrid church is going to be an interesting thing. Next week, I'll pick up where I left off, and we'll talk about some of um, where I think um, the, the church is, is moving. Um, and I think it's pretty exciting stuff, so... All right, we're out of time. We're going to stop there, and we'll see you guys in a few minutes. In the